back, everybody. It is time for the fifth and final episode of this mini-series, the Scoop Rewind podcast brought to you by PPG. The cast of characters remaining the same, Paul Staggerwald and Michelle Crecciolo and Sam Kassan, all with us lending our insight, our thoughts, and looking back at what now becomes, when we talk about this game specifically, Game 7, arguably the biggest, most exciting game in Penguins history. Uh, we all know how it turned out. We're going to get to the ending as we go through this podcast. But, guys, uh, what a lead-up it's been to this and going back through the three prior Penguins victories uh, in this Stanley Cup final against the Detroit Red Wings so far. And I think it's really interesting, and there's probably some bias here with the three of us, uh, four of us, I guess, counting myself. Uh, but we cover hockey. We're around hockey. So I think we probably all think, I, I don't want to speak for anyone, but the Stanley Cup playoffs in and of themselves, the best postseason in professional sports. And then when you make it a game seven in that Stanley Cup playoffs, in the Stanley Cup final to win the Stanley Cup, it doesn't get any better than that. And what a scene it was at Joe Lewis Arena for that game seven. Yeah, I mean, this is all the most you can ask for as a hockey fan and just someone who loves the sport. And I can't even imagine what was going through everybody's minds, uh, fans, team uh, players, you know, coaches, management, just everybody involved uh, around this game. Just it's the highest uh, stakes you could possibly imagine. So and it did not disappoint. That's for sure. I remember being uh, really excited to go and see the game, but not having a way to get there. Uh, so I texted Mario desperation I said you know is there any way I could get to the game tonight and uh he said yeah I have uh, two two planes he goes you can go on one of the the other plane so I went out to the airport and I took a, a private jet to game seven with Pierre LaRouche and a couple other people were on there I don't remember exactly who who else was on and we flew in and landed 45 minutes before game time and got in a limo and got to the game about 20 minutes before puck drop. So that was like as, as convenient a way as you could possibly imagine going to any game, let alone a game seven in the Stanley Cup final. So I'm forever indebted to, uh, to Mario and, uh, and, and, you know, obviously uh, indebted to whoever the pilot was uh, for, for getting us there safely to watch that game and home too, by the way. Interesting you mentioned Mario Lemieux. It probably brings us to a good segue as far as Game 7 was concerned. We talked a little bit earlier in the series after Game 5 how he was down by the Penguins dressing room making sure guys knew that he was around, he was available, and he was going through this Stanley Cup final emotionally just like they were. And then he took it to a whole other level before Game 7, Sam, as you documented very well on PittsburghPenguins.com. Yeah, it all kind of did. You're, you're right, Josh. Uh, it did begin with that game five loss, and Mary went into the locker room and he tried to show them just some sense of calm, some sense of confidence. He knew that they were a little bit down, and that's kind of where this whole story of the text message began. And uh, for those who obviously remember the story, the, the text message that Mario sent to the entire team is, quote, this is a chance of a lifetime to realize your childhood dream to win a Stanley Cup. Play without fear, and you will be successful. See you at center ice, Mario. So that's a good way to wake up for uh, the morning of game seven. But as I said, going back, the, the kind of steps that led up to it are just pretty interesting too. It, it began again, as I said, Mario being in the locker room after the game five loss. And then Ray Shiro actually texted Mario and thanked him for being in the room. And then Mario responded, uh, quote again, we are family and in this together. We don't need anyone that's only with us win or tie. I think this is our year. Let's forget about it tonight. It happens, we'll win on Tuesday, meaning game six and win the cup Friday. So Ray actually shared that with some of the coaching staff because the coaches were kind of down. And then the day after they won game six, uh, Mary actually texted Tom McMillan, who's the VP of communications for the Penguins, also our boss, shout out Tom. Uh, Mary texted Tom and, uh, and asked him, he said, uh, Tom, do you think I should send a message to the guys before the game tomorrow, something inspirational, you know, along the lines of this is your chance to realize your childhood dream, see you at Center Ice Mario. And they kind of had a back and forth. And then somewhere along the, the way, Mary decided to add, play without fear and you'll be successful. successful. And so uh, they kind of bannered back and forth. And finally, Mary said, you know what? Go for it. We're going to win tomorrow. Send the text. So they did. They sent the text, obviously, to the boys. They got them amped up and got them fired up and ready to go. And, and go, looking back on it now, actually, one of the funny takeaways was Mario's quote, because as he was texting Tom, he basically said, you know, I'm no novelist. I just speak from the heart. And I think it might give the boys a little boost, you know, something as they step on the ice. I hope so anyway. 
Well, it worked. <laughs> of course, as everything married, it absolutely worked. And I think the brilliance of it too was uh, saying, I'll see you at Center Ice, because Mario kind of pinpointed on that. He wanted them to have that visualization that they were going to win the cup. They were going to see him at Center Ice. They were going to raise the cup. This was their chance. He wanted to embed it into their minds because, I mean, you talk about, this is a little off topic, but you talk about sports psychology and you think of like field goal kickers. What they do is they visualize the kick before they make the kick. Or as a goal tender, you visualize making the save before you make the save, et cetera, et cetera. So once it gets in your mind, you can kind of let the body take over. And I think Mary was trying to get that in their minds that they were going to win. And then that was kind of the boost that they needed the confidence was. You know what I think is really cool, too, is that he texted Tom McMillan and asked him if he thought it was a good idea. Uh, a, for Tom, that shows you the confidence he has in Tom's opinion of things like that. It also shows that Mario's cool enough to know that, you know, an idea that he has is probably worth bouncing off somebody first before he just goes ahead and does it. You know what I mean? It's just the, the whole, that whole process is intriguing to me. And uh, I think it's neat that, uh, that he did that. And uh, w- question I have, Sam, when did we all find out that he did it? I don't, that's what I, that's the part I don't remember. Was it after everything was over with? And then they kind of revealed that he had done this as, as I re- recall. Is that, 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 that right? Yeah, it was uh, uh, actually it was all the media came on to the ice and interviewing the players about winning the cup. That's when they said something because nobody said anything at the after the morning skate because obviously, yeah, I, mean, I don't want to say you, you lose. Jinx it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, you don't want to jinx it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, n- nobody said anything after the morning skate for Game Seven where Max Talbot quote unquote predicted his uh, big big outburst. But the, they were silent up until the moment when the media came onto the ice. And that's when I had first heard about it, actually, too, honestly. And, and that's when they first started speaking about it. Because even a lot of us in the staff, I think a lot of the trainers, equipment guys, they didn't know. Uh, this, it was solely with the, the coaches, the players, obviously, um, the GM knew. So it was, it was something they kept really closely intact in, in the dressing room. So, and that, but then once you win and – you know, the stories can be written and the, and the folklore can be told. And I think they all kind of came out with it. So it was, it was after the fact on the ice. And after, in retrospect, seeing this whole series play out again as we've done these podcasts, now I have a greater appreciation for him coming to center ice and dropping that puck before game one because it was like Mario's series as the owner. And, you know, he, he started it with the puck drop. And he ended it with being in center ice uh, you know, with the cup uh, and Sid and everybody. So that's pretty cool. And I, I, I just happened to know last night, and it was, we'll get to that, I'm sure, at the end of the game, but uh, on, on this celebration, uh, in the background, when they're interviewing the Penguin players, it just happens to be Natalie uh, Lemieux and Austin and one of the girls, I think it's Stephanie, uh, they just happen to be on the bench right behind where these interviews are being conducted. So you can see Natalie, how happy she is. And she's like a fan. It's just, what what sunk into me is this was a really personal victory for the Lemieux family to win that Stanley Cup. It was more than just a team thing, even an organization thing. It It was something they all wanted very badly for Mario and for themselves. And they were really having a good time with the win. Yeah, I mean, Mario did say the team got the new thing. That was the ultimate goal was to win a Stanley Cup. So it was a fruition of a lot of hard work that he put into. A lot of weird hard work. Mario obviously never wanted to be an owner. He wanted to be a player. And, you know, when he hung up his skates, I think he thought he'd be done forever. Now he's digging deep into bankruptcy issues and working with different creditors and, like, things he never, you know, and, you know, Mario, he's more of a, you know, he's not an outgoing, overly outgoing kind of guy. He's not like a Pierre LaRouche. So he's having to do all these things. He put in a lot of hard work and a lot of grind that, you know, he did for the best of Pittsburgh, for the best of the Penguins. So I think for him to see it kind of finally all come to fruition, it had to be extra special. I did love what uh, some of the players had to say, by the way, going back to the text message. Uh, Sam, you mentioned how it would be a good text to wake up to. And I thought it was funny that Sidney Crosby said, first of all, I didn't wake up. I don't think I slept, so I saw it right away. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, Max Halvey, you mentioned the positive thinking, and he actually said that's something he believes in, uh, you know, that, you know, the, the power of positive thinking. And he said by getting that text message, you know, it puts that image in your head that this is what it's going to look like, and it absolutely did. So, and I love your point, Saggy, about it coming full circle. It's just amazing, you know, from Mario standing at center ice to him meeting the team at center ice, it, it couldn't be more perfect. So 
Uh, definitely uh, such a such an awesome story, and I'm glad that we get to touch on it here for Game Seven. Daggy with the flair for the dramatic. <laughs> well, no, I just happened to you know it, it occurred to me because I didn't really remember that puck drop. You know, I, I didn't remember that moment. But seeing it on television, we talked about it in an early podcast. I mean, I don't know. You remember the crowd sound like on that tele on, on the telecast? It was an outpouring of emotion by the Penguins fans as he stood there. It was fabulous. Just a great, great moment. And and what a way to end it all with him, you know, texting and saying, I'll see you at center ice in Detroit and then winning the cup. I mean, you couldn't write a better script. Pardon? What were the phones yeah. back then? Were they the blackberries? Yeah. yeah, they were blackberries. Yeah, they were. It was a blackberry and they also closed it in the locker room. Yeah, they they took the actual text in the locker room as well. They hung it on the board. Penguins BB. Thank God we didn't sell the team to the guy that owned Blackberry. <laughs> Remember he he was interested for a while there. Yeah. Going back to that text though, you mentioned that text. I, I, am I mistaken here? I was reading something about also that morning skate. How you said Sam the players weren't obviously talking about the text. It wasn't even public then. A lot of people had no idea it existed except for the people within the thread. But I thought I remembered hearing or, or maybe reading Max Talbot saying that he felt like he was going to have a big game seven before it happened when he was interviewed the morning skate. And it, it kind of made me think back, totally different player, totally different situation. But one of my favorite teams growing up, I'm sorry in advance, Michelle, uh, was the 2001 Colorado Avalanche. Uh, I love that team. They were absolutely <laughs> loaded. When you're a young kid and you had that team to watch, like how could you not love that team? And I remember very clearly. <laughs> I still yeah, call you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still triggered by that, but sorry, go ahead. So one thing I remember really clearly from that is uh, in game six of the 2001 Stanley Cup final, the Avalanche were down three games to two, and they were going to overtime in New Jersey against the Devils, who, of course, like the Red Wings, had won the year before. And they were in the dressing room before overtime, and Ray Bork stood up and said, I'll get the next one, guys. He scores the overtime goal. They go next game back to Denver. They win the Stanley Cup. Then that iconic shot of him lifting the cup over his head happens. So I, I'm not saying that Max Talbot was going full on Ray Bork, but the morning of game seven to say that he felt like he was going to do something and then to have the night he did, I, mean, I can draw some comparisons. I think Max Talbot, from everything I've watched now, going back through this series, and by the way, watching these games, this is the first time I've watched them again. So, you know, in game seven, I watched it last night and I had never watched it. I mean, I was in, I was at the game, but I never went back and watched the actual game on television. So it was really cool to see it for the first time. But Max Talbot, again, was, he wasn't just the goals. It was all the stuff he was doing. He was used in so many different ways. He was like the secret weapon. I mean, not so much of a secret, but he was a weapon. It was used in, in multiple ways. And, um, you know, obviously the, the Conn Smythe winner was Evgeny Malkin for everything he did throughout the course of the series. But oftentimes that, that award isn't given until the final for a reason. Sometimes they don't know who's getting it until the very last game. And I got to tell you, Gino was absolutely most valuable in terms of points and stuff. But Max Talbot, I mean, you know, he was, he was number two in my book for Conn Smythe. That's how good he was. That's how much of an impact he made. Gold. Yeah. Big you all huge goals. <laughs> yeah, he had eight goals in the playoffs. Four of the eight were in the final alone. So, and he had two two cool games. So, <laughs> game three, which is pivotal for the Penguins, and obviously game seven. So he saved his best for the biggest moments. So Sam, when you hear him say that in you know his media scrum that morning, do you immediately think of it when he has a couple of goals in that game, or was there so much else going on that maybe got lost in the shuffle? I did, but I remember. Uh, I don't think he has much predicted he was going to have a big game. As he said, he wanted to have a big game. Now, again, like the folklore kind of takes over. But in the scrum, or at least from what I heard, maybe he said something different to different reporters. I can't be sure of that. But I remember he, him saying that, you know, everybody wants to be, like, this is the big thing that everybody dreams of. What do you think of? Blah, blah, blah. Who, you know, do you want to be the hero? And, like, and he said, of course, everybody wants to be the hero. I want to be the hero tonight. That's Every, that's every kid's dream. That's every hockey player's dream to want to be the big hero in game seven. And that's what I want to be. So I don't think it was as much him saying, I'm going to do this, but the fact that he then went out and did it. <laughs> so uh, it did. As soon as he, well, I will say, like when he scored the first one, I was kind of like, oh, huh, interesting. Cause you don't know how it's going to play out at that point. 
Like maybe they lose three one. Maybe they win four one, and his one goal while contributes isn't like the big thing. But when he scored the second one, I was like, oh man, this is gonna be a this is gonna be a whole <laughs> thing. This is gonna be a huge deal. Uh, it, it definitely struck me right away whenever he got that, especially when he got that second one because it was so such a tight game that you, you didn't think there were gonna be a lot of goal scores. And then when he got the second one, it was like, oh man, this 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 score might hold up the way this game's going. I mean, you, it could have been a two nothing game at the final, so it definitely uh, popped into my mind. Let's go back to the first period. Let's jump into the game. We've we kind of set it up here as far as Game Seven is concerned. I, I was looking at the opening face-off. Penguins starting with Sidney Crosby, Chris Kunitz, and Billy Garen, which um, obviously, as we've documented here on this podcast, two guys on either side of Sid were brought in to try to get the Penguins to this kind of a game, to have this kind of an opportunity. I found that kind of, uh, you know, metaphorical as far as where they were at in that point in the series, kind of interesting. But the first 10 minutes or so of this game, it it, it felt like both teams still had that uh, the tentative style, I guess, to their play. Maybe, maybe a little bit of nerves, obviously. I can't say any of us can speak from experience of playing in a game seven of a final, but uh, from watching it, you get, you can see, and you can understand the nerve factor. Tight checking, man. It was uh, right from the start. I mean, nobody wants to make a mistake. At that point, they're they're playing carefully. You know, it's a uh, game seven is a entity unto itself. It's 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 separate from the other six games in the series. It, it takes on a life of its own because it's a one game winner takes all proposition at that point. And it's kind of like a Super Bowl, if you will, in a way. I mean, it becomes a a big event, and so whole lot different than, you know, what well, we got a tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. There's no tomorrow for either team. Both teams are facing elimination. Both teams have become intimately familiar with one another. And I think that was uh, evident early in the game. I, it just felt like these two teams have become very respectful of each other's talents, very aware of what each other could do, player by player. And they were sticking to one another out there and playing a more close-checking, defensive, playoff-style game right from the start. And I think some edge to start just, I think, being at home, feeding off the crowd, having that momentum. And I think, you know, you saw that in the first 30 seconds. Actually, Henrik Zetterberg and Dan Cleary each had chances right away. Mark andre Fleury was sharp right from the start. So, you know, obviously the save at the end, which I'm sure we'll discuss in detail, is the one everybody remembers when they think of this game, when they think of Mark andre Fleury's career in general. But he actually, I mean, those two saves at the beginning were clutch and they were key. I mean, if he doesn't make those and the Red Wings score off one of those and, and get the crowd going, and we all know the stats of the, team that, of the team that scores the first goal in a game seven is most likely going to end up winning the game. And uh, so for, for him, for the flower to, to bloom that early, so to speak, uh, was huge for the Penguins, I think. I think we brought up Talbot too, because going in, the one roster change they made was, if you recall, we talked about game six, how they put Sakura back in the lineup. When they put Sakura back in the lineup, they put him with Malkin instead of Tanko and actually bumped Max Talbot down to the fourth line, interestingly enough. Well, then in that game, somewhere in that game, uh, Sakura hurt his foot. So he was scratched for game seven. And when he was scratched for game seven, they bumped Talbot up to the second line with Malkin and Fedot Tanko. So interesting, uh, just a little something to ponder there, because if Sakura is healthy and he plays on that second line, and Talbot's minutes are a little reduced. Who knows how things kind of play out? And I know we'll get into City Crosby's injury as well. Because then they bumped Max Talbot into the third spot, and that with uh, Cook and Kennedy, it became Cook Talbot Kennedy. So his minutes kind of increased even there. So it was a interesting kind of the way things unfolded. But imagine Peter Sikora plays, and all of history probably changes as well. And that's just a, another example of how interchangeable some of those pieces were in a positive way. I mean, of course, within that Penguins lineup, especially deeper in the lineup, it's outshot the Red Wings 10 to 6 in the first period. A couple of things that jumped out to me, I'm sure you guys, if you have anything, feel free to share. But uh, the, and I, I love how Doc Emmerich called it the Cronwallian hit, which I know became a thing with Nick Cronwall on Max Talbot. Uh, thank God Max saw him at the last half second there. Otherwise, he's probably not scoring any goals in that game because he's probably unconscious. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was uh, that was something that stood out to me. Penguins drew a penalty uh, seconds after that on Brad Stewart. But otherwise, I mean, you, you had some saves, as Michelle mentioned early, from Marc-Andre Fleury at the other end. I thought Chris Osgood late in the period was really good. A uh, particular save that jumped out to me was Fleury off the draw on Alpi. A little windmill with the glove to keep it out. Yeah, that's uh, the guy. <laughs> I know. Sorry, Michelle. We're just crushing all your <laughs> 
I know, my heart. Those are some things that jumped out to me. I didn't think the first period, I mean, as far as drama was concerned, it didn't uh, swing the pendulum all that much. As, as Staggy mentioned, just the tight checking, two really good teams that understood each other. I think it, in, in a sense, it, it gave the Penguins confidence because they had been so awful. Let's, play, let's face it, in Detroit, although in games one and two, they felt they played better, but their record, their results in Detroit were so disheartening that just to come out of that first period without any goals being scored on them and being in good shape was probably a victory of sorts psychologically. Uh, Billy Guerin got the first shot of the game for the Penguins five minutes into the game, just to give you an idea of how things began in this game. And uh, you mentioned uh, the, the hit uh, by Cronwall. I, I, I can see Cronwall doing a lot of that in his career against the Penguins, and I was always upset that the, the officials let him get away with things like that because many times I felt it was interference, like that he would hit a guy who never touched the puck, which is exactly what he did on Tal, but it should have been a penalty. And I happened to be listening to the Pittsburgh radio broadcast synced up with the television, so I got a chance to hear what Phil Bork said, and that's what he said. He said he thought it should have been a penalty, and then they did have a penalty right after that, and it was a good power play for the Penguins. They didn't score, but they got some momentum out of that, and of course the Penguins' power play had been phenomenal throughout the entire series. There was a point in the period, you might remember this, Michelle, because you probably thought there should have been a penalty when Malkin uh, went to the net with Philpola and kind of tied up his stick as he was going to the goal. It was a really good scoring chance uh, for Philpola, no penalty called. This was late in the period. And also I noticed, and I wanted to ask you, Michelle, about this, they had Dotsuk and Zetterberg together. Was that always the case? Was that a two-headed monster uh, for Detroit, or were they usually in, on separate lines? I think that's his natural position and same with Zetter. So um, I want to say they were usually on separate lines, but uh, unlike Sid and Gino, who don't usually play all that well together for extended periods, I think obviously Datsuk and Zetterberg were two players that were able to do that more for extended periods. So I think it was definitely a combination that Babcock went to a lot these two years that the Wings went to the final against uh, the Red Wings for sure. I, th I thought the Red Wings were, well, and, and you know, Mike and Borky made good points about this. They weren't shooting the puck, and when they were, they weren't getting it on the net. And the Penguins were blocking a ton of shots. And what they were saying, uh, and we could, you know, th this, this holds true throughout the hockey game, some big blocks early and late, um, that, you know, that was a, a facet of the Penguins game that really the media were really starting to take note of, and the coaches on the opposition – and like members of the Detroit organization, they were marveling at how many shots the Penguins were blocking. I thought that was interesting. Uh, that the, you know, a lot of guys were giving up their bodies to, to block shots. That was a big part of why the Penguins were successful. Another gritty aspect of their game, you know, the hitting, the blocking of shots. Those are the two things on the grit meter, I call it, that were very high for the Penguins in this series. They had 20 blocks. They also had 20 blocks in game six, too. So it was kind of, you could see the desperation level as well. Yep. One thing, and what stood out to me too, I think, because uh, Staggy actually mentioned this in the previous games. We were talking about how great Helm were, how great Cleary were in the series, and they kept getting all these great chances and great scoring opportunities. But then Staggy pointed out, and I went and looked it up. He said, "It's great they're getting all these chances, but they never score." And so uh, I looked it up. Helm and Cleary combined in the seven games, three points, two goals, one assist. So those those two guys combined for three points over seven games. You think about all the great opportunities they had. Conversely, you had the Penguins with like Tyler Kennedy coming through, Jordan Stahl coming through, Max Talbot coming through, all these, all these uh, role players, if you will. And, and I think that was a huge difference throughout the series, obviously in the game seven. But Cleary had two great chances in the uh, first period. Like Michelle said, one was right off the hop, like 30 seconds in. And those guys just couldn't score. And I think in the second period, Cleary actually blocked a shot from Lidstrom, his own player, might have been ticketed for the goal. He was trying to get out of the way. <laughs> But uh, it was just it, just those guys, like, as, as great as they were all series, they just couldn't convert. And I think that kind of edged the difference in, in maybe in the overall game. It's funny. I remember Jim Rutherford, when he was hired, he said, a lot of times the stars cancel each other out in the playoffs. It's those other guys who make the difference. And that was a classic case of that. And that's why I'll say it. I said it already a few times on these podcasts. The team with the best role players wins the cup. And the Penguins definitely had the best, best role players in the NHL. Uh, in the playoffs, and that's why they won. I, you know, we know they have stars, but everybody has stars. 
It's those guys that make the difference. And can they put the puck in the net? Sometimes they don't score all year in the regular season, like a guy like Craig Adams. But they wait for the right time to put the puck in the net. Max Talbot being the ultimate example of that in my book because he wasn't a guy who was putting up a lot of numbers during the regular season. But, boy, throughout his career, even in junior, he was good in the playoffs. Yeah, I would agree with that because I felt like <laughs> – Something where the stars shine for both teams, that their best players were their best players. We talked about, you know, Zetterberg having a million scoring chances, you know, how good uh, Sid and Gino were and, and, and how big of a boost Datsuk was. But I felt like in this game seven that they did cancel each other. I didn't think that Datsuk and Zetterberg had much of an impact at all on the game, really, in, in the in the long run. And, you know, Sid and Gino, obviously, the Penguins lost Sid. And Gino had some moments, but it definitely was Max Talbot's night and his game and so I, I thought that was interesting that I felt like they the, the best players didn't make a whole lot of an impact, I thought, in, in this, you know, game seven. I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but it did feel like they can't. I mean, Sid was injured nine, at 9.35 of a – which period was it? The second or the third? First period. First second period. Huh? Second period, yes. I think it was earlier. <clears throat> Five and a half minutes in. Yeah. Five and a half, yeah. yeah was, there was 14.36 on the clock whenever he got uh, – took that hit from Franzen. Got it. So second period, you know, we're talking about Max, right, Josh? That's yeah. He gets the first goal. That's a man. Was that a big goal? You know, you talk about first goals, but the longer it takes for that first goal to be scored, the bigger it is when it is scored. I think you also saw that. You know, you mentioned two things earlier. Max obviously in and of himself, and all players. And you have a guy like Max playing with Geno Malkin there to begin the second period, which was nothing new with Dan Bilesman, as we've discussed throughout this podcast. But it was certainly something that gave the Penguins an edge with these guys being able to jump up and down the lineup and produce. And in that situation, uh, I found it interesting that Brad Stewart was the defenseman because he had an adventure of a game seven overall. Uh, but I think Max Talbot's going to be in his nightmares and probably still is to this day. <laughs> and <laughs> Yeah, and yours. Yeah, that's fair, too. Uh, but, you know, I, I I give the Penguins a lot of credit. Like, there's something to be said for those early goals. We talk about them a lot. But maybe to your point, Staggy, with, with how the Penguins played coming out of that first period with it being scoreless, to get a little bit of energy from that, and then just a minute 13 into that second period to kind of ride that wave of maybe, uh, I don't want to say newfound confidence, because I think they certainly believed in themselves to win that game. But uh, rejuvenated energy, maybe. I don't know how I would describe it, but they wrote it to a point to get the lead and get that all important first goal. Their speed and their tenacity and their, um, you know, the, the depth of talent and their forechecking uh, per se was, I think, a big factor in that whole series. And Max Talbot, as much as we talk about the goals he scored, I mentioned it in one of our previous podcasts, right for the first time I ever saw the guy play a pro hockey game, he was really good at getting in on defensemen really quickly. He gets right on them. For some reason, he, he was able to turn pucks over. He's not a big guy, but for, he, he knew how to get in there and make a defenseman, force a defenseman to make a mistake. And um, not only did he force the turnover, then he ended up being the beneficiary of it and scoring the goal. And he didn't waste any time getting that puck through Osgood. That was a, just a great, great moment uh, in the game because the Penguins just needed to be rewarded for the fact that they were doing a lot of little things right. And uh, I felt like their game was – they were carrying the play, if you will. And I say that meaning they looked like they were the team that was playing with confidence. They were the team that was making things happen. And they had nothing to show for it until Talbot scored that goal. Yes, thank you mentioned the goal. It wasn't just that Talbot got into the four check and forced the turnover, over. But then after the puck came, because the puck came off of Malkin's skate and right to time. So he had to have a quick reaction to just collect the puck. And then he went, and as soon as he got the puck right at the side of the net, Osgood committed and went down. But Talbot didn't shoot right away. He cut to the middle, forced Osgood to kind of get up and reset, which he probably should have just stayed down and shuffled over. But Osgood went to get up and reset. And as he's getting up, that's when Max shot it off quickly. And that's how he beats him. Because if he shoots it right away, Osgood makes the save. Or if he waits a split second longer, Osgood gets down and makes the save. So literally, it was the, the perfect move and I remember interviewing him for the um the 50th anniversary documentary and he said he, he kind of realized that he said he got the puck on his stick and he looked up and Osgood was down so he didn't want to shoot it right away and he had a little bit of an opening to cut to the net so he started to cut to the net because as, as he was going he saw Osgood kind of reset and that's when he just snapped it off so he, he initially was going to shoot saw Osgood was down recollect and think of all this all this thought process too in the matter of 
what, a fourth of a second. He's got to kind of compute all this. And we talk about hockey IQ and hockey players and sense awareness. And I mean, Talbot's clearly a smart, smart player as well as his other attributes. But the fact that he was able to quick so act so quickly on his feet, think and react, and then be able to get that goal, I think it was really, a, it was a beautiful goal. I mean, it doesn't, it looks like he just kind of throws at the net, but really the, the mind games that were in there between him and Osgood, it was a beautiful goal. Well, I feel like we always talk so much about Sid's hockey IQ and how he thinks the game more than anybody else, and rightfully so, because he does, but every single player in the NHL, I mean, they're better than the majority of hockey players in the, they're the best hockey players in the world, all of them. I mean, if you played you know, a pickup game with who you think is the worst player in the NHL, they're still going to skate circles around you because they're, you know, they are just that good. So I think it's amazing to see that, you know, every guy at that level thinks the game at such a high level. And, you know, Sam, you mentioned talking to, to Max Talbot for the um, 50th anniversary documentary. And I thought it was cool because he said, too, I don't think we got a chance to see the celebration of Max in full because they were busy. You know, the analysts were breaking down the play, but you know, Max said he'll never forget Gino's face when he jumped into his arms and, and he'll never forget Fedotenko's face at the same time. And he remembers skating back once to see Flurry and gives him like a, a wave, like, it, like, you know, acknowledging him, which I thought was really cool. And just, uh, you know, we talk so much about chemistry and camaraderie between teams. And I know, Sag, you and I talked about that a lot on the radio for this previous season about this team. But I think it's, it's moments like that where you see how close they are and how connected they are. And to take that moment to go back and give Flurry like a, you know, just a, a high five. I, I thought that was really cool to, to hear him talk about that. Yeah, and you know, I, I, they showed, uh, going to a commercial break on the telecast last night, they showed uh, a little glimpse of that thing that Flurry and Talbot used to do before the game where they got nose to nose and, and they, you know, made those faces at each other. That was like their little ritual before the game, those two guys. And uh, they just showed a little snippet of it. I don't know if you saw that, guys, when they went to one of the commercial breaks. So those two had just had a special deal going, you know, right from right from the start. So it was it's always cool to see them uh, interact. You know, in the, you know, that's one thing about those those guys. They were young. I mean, they were young and they were having a good time. It was a loose team, and uh, they they were really enjoying uh, the ride there. I, it, it's the, the, we talked about the veteran players, Kunitz and Garen, at the start of the game, flanking Sidney Crosby. Make no mistake, those guys were. Big factors, but also the youthful exuberance of this team and uh, was was a big factor, I think, too, versus a Red Wing team that maybe just had a little bit more in their bellies. They were not quite as hungry uh, as the Penguins were, who were desperately trying to win, and the Red Wings had already won just a year before. By Max Talbot towards Mark Andre Fleury after he scores. I actually wrote that down. And I said it, it kind of, to me, showed that there was a, a little bit more of a quiet confidence than we even maybe realized about not just Max, but this Penguins team. Just kind of like, okay, there's one. Yeah. We're in front now. That now, now we take care of business from here on out. That's how I read it, at least. It was a great shot on, M, on uh, Versus, I think, or NBC, whoever was broadcasting it at the time, um, of him just kind of giving that subtle pump. And you know he's looking at Flower when he does it. And I think there's something to be said for that, yeah. It's hard not to actually also acknowledge the French Canadian flavor of it all, you know, with Mario and and then those two guys being the big, you know, big stars, um, especially Talbot, but obviously the goalie flower too, making the big say. I, I I just think it's kind of cool that there was a there definitely was a French Canadian flavor to the Penguins because of Mario being at the top and 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 really if you think about it throughout the history of the Penguins, there's been a lot of French Canadian spice. Uh, with the Penguins going all the way back to Jean Pronovo and Pierre LaRouche, and uh, of course Mario coming along, and then Flower, Chris Letang, and uh, Pascal Dupuis later on became a very prominent figure. So we've had a lot of, uh, and of course I didn't mention, but Michel Briere was a heck of a hockey player, and I, was, I got a chance to watch him. So thank God for those French Canadians. More ways than one. Take that one nothing lead. They get the important first goal, and then just over four-ish minutes later, Sidney Crosby gets hit by Jan Franz and by the scores table. Take me through what you guys were thinking in that exact moment. Uh, all three, you can kind of share your thoughts. I guess Staggy, we can start with you. And when you see Crosby go down, and they made a big emphasis on it during the broadcast of noting that he was taking a long time to get back to the Penguins bench. You kind of hear the crowd reacting at Joe Lewis Arena in the moment as well, too. Well, can I, I here's here's the deal with me. I, I got to the game. I didn't have a ticket. I didn't have a seat in the press box. And if anybody knows anything about Joe Lewis Arena, you guys know 
There is no press box. They forgot to build one when they built the arena in 1979. I'm not kidding. I mean, they put, it's, it's, it's the last, it's behind the last row of seats. And in Joe Lewis Arena, it was one big bowl. So in the last row of the bowl was this press box that had very little room. The booths are small and everything. So there, the way you get into it was you had to come in from the side, from the seating area to get into the press box. So I stood at the top of the aisle that led from the press box down towards the ice. I, and there behind me was a door. You could take this door, go out, and then you could take the steps down to the bowels of the arena. So that's where I stood. And I was so I was just looking to my right. I could see Ray Shiro and the Penguin staff. Uh, and I stood there. So I'm looking up the wall to my right as Sid gets hit by Franz. And so I couldn't, it was hard to really tell exactly what happens when you're, you know, you miss a good game, guys, a lot of times when you're in the stands. <laughs> Uh, it's one thing you learn. Like you get the atmosphere, you get the odd replays on the scoreboard. In fact, don't forget this is an old building, but you don't necessarily get the same depth uh, of what's going on in the game when you're at the game. And so, you ask to answer your question. I don't remember the Sid hit that vividly, just other than the fact that I know he went off the ice and he was shaken up. So, and then he would he had been hit on the wall. Watching the game again last night, I realized he got hit hard. And that was a bad hit on his left knee, and there's a reason why he only took one more shift the rest of the night. By the way, I said it's 9.35. I think that's the time that he came back for his last shift midway through the third period. Um, I wrote down 6.30 into the second, roughly, is when he collides with Johan Franzen. And the real on Franzen collides with him. That was a <laughs> – the mule got him good there, no doubt. Speaking of interference, I mean, that, that was a clear interference there where there's a loose puck and both guys are going for it. Crosby's trying to get it, and Franz just cuts off his angle to the puck and just hits it. And the guy doesn't even have the puck. So, Michelle, that should have been a penalty, no offense. Uh, that being said, uh, I actually I, – that, I meant to look back at that, Sam. So, expand on that. So, what, what, what exactly happened in that sequence? Because I looked at it last night, but I forgot to look for that, see if he had touched the puck. Yeah, the puck was actually going along, <clears throat> excuse me, along the wall in the neutral zone. And Crosby was tracking to get there, and Franzen was coming across. So Crosby's trying to get the puck at the neutral zone. Franzen's coming across, and instead of even going, angling towards the puck, he just hits him. So Crosby doesn't have the puck. It's ahead of him. He's just going to retrieve it. He had never touched it at all? No. That's, it. That's what I wanted last night. I, I knew it was ahead of him, but I thought maybe he had pushed it that way. But he never touched the puck. See, you know, it, that's the kind of stuff that drives you crazy. I mean, seriously. <laughs> I mean, really. You know? But it's game seven of the final stag. The whistles oh, I know play. all about it. I know all about it. But, you know. Well, I will say I didn't – because we were watching the play. I was actually watching the puck. And I saw the hit but didn't think anything of it. Because then you see the hit, but then you're following the way the puck trajects. And the Penguins, I think, they went D to D in their zone. And then that's when you see Crosby hunched over. 87 kind of just gliding along the blue line, really, and not even like kicking. Like he's just gliding. And, and, and I, I, they did say uh, it took him forever to get to the bench. And at that point, I just kind of watched him and zoned in on him because, I, as Staggy said, we were in the press box. So I was just watching him go to the bench, get to the bench, and he went straight down the tunnel. And you're just thinking, oh, man, you, of all the times this could happen, of all the games that you could lose, not only your captain, but the best player in the world. You know, this, this is not, not ideal. This is not an ideal circumstance. The one thing I will say is the Penguins did have a one nothing lead at the time. So put them in a little bit better position. They would eventually make it a 2 nothing lead. So you're playing a little bit ahead. You've got a little room for error. And the other thing is it was about, they'd had, what, 35 minutes left in the game. So they had to fend off Detroit. It wasn't that they had to play an entire game without Crosby. But they had to fend them off for the final 35 minutes, which is hard enough to do. You're just hoping you can minimize as much of the impact as you can. Yeah, and, you know, right after that, you know, you get the swing, right? You got Sid leaves, and then the Red Wings get their first power play opportunity. Uh, it's a holding call, and uh, I think on Gino, I, I, I don't know who had the box, but anyway, the Wings had been four for 21 in the playoffs, and they were three of those four goals, uh, in the series rather, and three of those four goals were scored in game five. So their power play, as good as it was, it was the number one power play in the regular season. Uh, it wasn't that great except for that one game in this series. That was a great opportunity for them to tie the game, and they, they couldn't pull it off. Penguins penalty killers did the job. 
I think as from a Detroit point, that's where the you know entire game changed for them. I think you know, when you look back on it, that's the play where I don't want to say they lost the game, but you know we we've talked about and Mike Sullivan talks about all the time about grabbing momentum and. The Red Wings had a huge opportunity to do that, you know, in front of their, you know, home crowd, in front of their fans to in, right after the Penguins lose Sidney Crosby to get a power play goal and they didn't take advantage. So I think, you know, looking back on this game as a whole, you know, we can talk about Nick Litcham not being able to score in the final seconds. Uh, but I think this sequence here is where the game turned for them because they couldn't find a way to swing the momentum back in their favor. And you mentioned it earlier, Josh, and I think it's worth mentioning again as a, uh, just how brilliantly the coaching staff juggled their players after Sid went out and found different combinations and how lucky the Penguins were to have some really good players that they could bring up from their fourth line and plug in. And, you know, they started off with uh, Malkin playing with Dupuy uh, and Fedotenko. And Fedotenko, by the way, was flying, okay? He had scored a couple big goals in a game seven for Tampa. You could tell he was enjoying the moment. Yeah, and I, I don't know if people really appreciate what a what an impact he made! But he was he played really well in this game. He was he was motoring out there, and then you know you had Kunitz playing with Stahl and Garen. So Stahl moved up to play between Kunitz and Garen and Sid Sidney Crosby spot. You had Talbot with um, Kunitz and Kennedy uh, at one point. So you had all these different combinations. But the guys that were able to move around were uh, Pui and Talbot, and of course Stahl moving up which was a good thing because he was raring to go too. I thought Stahl was playing with a tremendous amount of confidence in the, in the added ice time. He really took advantage of it. I, I, I thought probably more than any other player, I don't want to say he benefited. I don't know what word to use, but he took advantage of the opportunity when Sidney Crosby got hurt. Actually, I was curious when you are taking that, Staggy, because I was surprised they did break up the cook stahl Kenny line because they were so effective against the Red Wings. I, I understand bumping up. Your next best center is Stahl. You bump him up with Garen and Kunitz kind of to fill the void. And then, honestly, by the third period, it was just a mission. I mean, Tommy Fitzgerald was probably just sweating on the bench, running up and down, tapping anybody you could. Because it was literally like every combination you could possibly imagine. Like there was – by the time you got to the third period, there were no line combos. They were just throwing out anybody that they could, any bodies. I think Garen took a shift with Adams and, you know, Shatan was up with Kunitz and Talbot. I mean, there was just – everybody was everywhere. And you wondered at what point, you know, when is it like because they're in the middle of a change and not everybody can get off? Because I know when when Talbot scores, if I'm not mistaken, and you can correct me on this, but it's Kunitz who makes a, a great play on the wall. Great wall play. And, he, and he's out there with Kennedy and Kunitz and Talbot. So, so I, I think at that point, Kunitz had been on the previous – yeah, he was on the previous shift – and because he's a left winger, he was on the far side of the ice, so he couldn't get off. So he, he makes one last play on the wall there to bump the puck up to Talbot, and away he goes on a two-on-one. What a goal, I mean. And I thought of this earlier in, the, in our podcasts. Remember when Talbot hit the post on Osgood in Pittsburgh early in the, in the, in the series? He, he rang one off the post on him. And I, if you, when you're, I remember seeing that replay, and at the time while we were doing this podcast, I thought, boy, that's a kind of a portent of things to come because – Osgood was off his angle, and, and Talbot could easily have scored there, but he hit the post on the far side. So when he came down that wing, uh, there was a lot of net to shoot at. I don't know if Osgood liked to cheat over to the one side. Talbot may have known it, but he went right for that spot again, and this time he nailed it in the upper right-hand corner. You mentioned it earlier, Talbot. He played a junior, Talbot, a goal-scoring machine. And this, I think sometimes you forget about these things when these players develop their more uh, – NHL role, I guess you could say. Tom Kunakel was a guy like that for the Penguins, who was unbelievably gifted as far as a goal scorer and point producer in junior, and then obviously took on more of a checking line winger role in the NHL. And Max Talbot, similar kind of things. The guy put up 100 plus points in junior, so he can shoot the puck. You just don't always get those kind of opportunities uh, when you're playing deeper in the line of playing in a more defensive minded role, a more checking line role. And I give him a lot of credit because that was, a, as uh, we've heard Phil Bork say on the radio many times, a goal scorer's goal. He picked his shot there and he put it home. Absolutely. And, you know, he, he was a more gifted player. And that's one of the reasons why he had got an opportunity to play with Gino because they recognized that. And, you know, he'd been a centerman. So, you know, to put him on the wing. So he was versatile. Um, he, he did have latent offensive ability that, you know, wasn't so latent in junior, but in the NHL level it was. So it's just uh, – 
cool that, you know, that he was able to show that, you know, and to demonstrate that he is capable of putting the puck in the net and maybe a more offensive player. And I think ultimately that was what got him a real nice contract later on in life. You know, he was able to show that he could score goals uh, just enough as a role player uh, to make an impact on his team. Not one of those guys that scores two a year, but a guy who could score enough to make himself more valuable, not just a checker. You talk about Detroit in 2008, how they made new mistakes. There's another instance where Yuri Hoodler, you know, the, the Penguins just rim this puck around. Scuderi just rims it around in a hope play. He knows he's got Kunitz on the support. So he gets it to Kunitz, and then Brad Stewart steps up on Kunitz to try to keep the puck in. A, I don't know why he's stepping up anyway, because the rest of the Red Wings were. <laughs> it was the Red Wings was changing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the rest of the Red Wings group was changing. So why would you. Michelle, do you have a poster of Brad Stewart with like a dartboard? <laughs> like, do you have darts up in your room? So, me. <laughs> <laughs> Me and like my best friend on uh, my teammate on Michigan State. We, I mean, I clearly remember her and I texting each other every time he made a mistake like that throughout the game. And there were many texts exchanged back and forth because he did make a decent amount of mistakes in that game. So he was absolutely the goat for uh, Red Wings fans for the game. <laughs> for Christmas, Michelle, we're going to give you a Brad Stewart voodoo doll for Christmas. <laughs> It'll be the best gift ever. It was a bad read. He steps up and pinches for no reason. And then Yuri Hitler, instead of dropping back and taking his spot in a reload, decides to double team the pinch. So now you got two on one with nobody really back. And then Kunitz, all he does is a little chip play to get at the top of that two on one. So it, it was like back to back mental mistakes from the Red Wings that you just didn't see in 2008. So the Penguins come on that two on one top of scores. And the thing that stood out to me about Osgood, everyone knows he was off his angle. What always surprised me was he was off his angle on the near side. So for a goaltender, when there's a two-on-one, you tend to, to cheat a little towards the, the pass option. So, you want it, so Kennedy's coming down on the other side. You want to kind of be ready to get over if you need to. So you kind of tend to cheat to your left in this situation for Osgood. So you would expect him to be kind of cheating left. Well, in this one, he was kind of cheating right. So it just leads me to believe that, A, he sold out on the shooter, and then, B, just kind of had no – you know, proprioceptor on where he was as far as his goal crease and his net and like just kind of was a little bit lost. You know, once he came out hard to challenge, he was a little bit lost in where his placement was. So uh, he, he clearly sold out on the shooter there, but then just completely baffled or boshed where he needed to be. But like I said, normally when you see a goaltender off his angle on a two on one, he's cheating against the shooter and the pass option. And this time he cheated the other way. So it just leads me to believe it was another, again, another mental mistake. Yeah. You know, and Talbot, to his credit, like we were just saying, you know, like Josh was saying, guy has the ability to put the puck in the net. So give me that, give me that corner. I'm taking it. You know, and he put it right where he wanted. What a goal. That was a, I remember that moment. I remember seeing that goal scored and just, and I love, love, love that picture of Talbot. It's like one of the greatest pictures. When you see it in the hallway at PPG Paints Arena, he's got that look like the cat that ate the canary look on his face. When he's down on his knees celebrating it, that's just a famous photo. I wish I had it. I'd hold it up and show it to you guys. I just love that picture. Uh, like, it, there's a certain look on his face, like, we got him now, boys. It's so great. That's, that's what he said, Seg. He said uh, he, that he felt subconsciously he knew that was going to be the game winning goal. So that's why he went down on his knees. He said, I don't know what came through me, but just subconsciously knowing it was going to be the game winning goal, it just felt like an intense moment. And so that's why he, he went down like that. So you're absolutely right. He, he did know that that, you know, in hindsight, that that was that was it. Well, it wasn't as easy. I wish it was as easy as just saying that because it's sure watching this game. I don't know. I don't know. A lot, a lot of people didn't have a. You know, you ever talk to fans and say, "I couldn't watch. I had to leave the room." Like it's pretty funny when people get so wrapped up in something that they can't even enjoy it. You know, and I I would think that there were many many people in Western Pennsylvania who were feeling that way for the last half of that hockey game. Like just let's get this thing over with. You know, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, imagine that, you know, the, well, I don't know how players feel, but they look at that clock and it just, it looks like it's taking forever. And um, it, that, that second goal did prove to be the big one, but man, there was a lot of stuff that happened between the time he scored it and the end of the game. Another interesting dynamic to that, uh, the Penguins obviously had to win game six and seven to win the Stanley Cup, but they really locked things down as far as allowing goals uh, in that situation. Coming into that second period, after that second period was up, with the Penguins up 2 nothing, Detroit had one goal in six periods. A lot of people, I was looking back on that last night. You, you think about game five where they scored five, but they didn't score in the third. They had one in game six, 
And then obviously didn't score until the third against game, in game seven. So I give the Penguins a lot of credit because, you know, obviously the power play was a big reason why Detroit was able to explode in game five. We've talked about that in the podcast. But uh, five on five, there were opportunities. Marc-Andre Fleury was very good. We mentioned the block shots. And I think there was more of a defensive mindset uh, than maybe the Penguins even get credit for than we've been giving them credit for, than a lot of other people have been giving them credit for. When you think about the grand scheme of things, especially over those last couple of games there in the final. Yeah, I agree. And I think one of the big things is that, you know, in the playoffs, you you know, when you're a high scoring team, as the Penguins were always noted for being, uh, and, and you're playing in tight, low scoring games, that's, a, that's something you have to learn how to do. And it's, it's not easy. The Red Wings were kind of noted for that. They, they, they won a lot of games 2-1, and it didn't, it didn't bother them to be in those kinds of games. In fact, they thrived on it. And I think in the Penguins case, um, that, you know, it had to be a learned experience through the playoffs to be able to deal with that pressure of going through a period without scoring, knowing that you're a team that relies on offense, you know, a lot to score. So they became a really good defensive team, you know, and, uh, but if you think about it, they had a lot of really good defensive players. But the one guy they had who was really a stud was Jordan Stahl. I mean, he was at that time, he was the top two way or defensive centerman in the NHL. And he was only 20 years old. And, uh, you saw how, how much he meant to the team. I thought he was sensational in Game 7. And one of the reasons throughout the series that the Penguins were able to keep the score down. Yeah, because I think looking back at this point, I mean, you, I think that's one of the things that goes down in folklore is how, you know, the Penguins only had one shot and, you know, the Red Wings tilted the ice in their favor. But... Watching it again, the Red Wings weren't as dominant as that shot total might make it out to be. And in my head, I thought they were. And I, in my head, thinking back, and I'm like, man, how could they not have scored? But yeah, the Penguins did do a phenomenal job of keeping them to the outside and, and limiting their great opportunities. And I mean, to, I mean, to Detroit's credit, they did have chances. They did have momentum at times. But for the most part, it definitely wasn't as uh, tilted, I think, as we might think it is now, you know, however many years after the fact. They did have shot attempts, but they did have shot attempts, Sam, and, you know, the Penguins did block a ton of shots. You know, and that's defense. I mean, that's what we're talking about. They, they paid the price to keep the score down. And Scotty Bowman says, you're successful when you make it difficult for the other team to score. <laughs> <laughs> Which sounds really simplistic in its, in its, on its face, but if you think about it, part of that is puck possession, not taking penalties. There's a lot of facets to – keeping the other team from scoring. Penguins were disciplined, too. Didn't take a lot of penalties. Blocked shots, out, out hit them. A lot, of, a lot of ingredients went into that, that win. Yeah, if you look at the – I marked a point in the second period, I think it was like seven minutes left, where Cronwall was teeing up a slap shot, and Miroslav Shatan literally laid out his entire body to block it. And, and I mean, this guy's a, an older player, a veteran guy, but he can sniff that cup, and he laid out his entire body. Could have taken it in the chin. I mean, he might have lost a few teeth on that shot. He literally just sprawled out, blocked the shot, and then Staggy brought up the penalty kill. Obviously, they, they didn't have a lot of power plays. Detroit only two in the game, but Penguins killed them both, and you're right. Other than the aberration that was the three for eight in game five, in every other game, in the other six games in the series, Penguins only gave up one power play goal. So the Penguins' penalty kill was absolutely dominant with the exception of the game five where the bottom kind of did fall out for the, the whole team in general, but it, that is the part of the defense. And to Michelle's point, I think she's right too, because the Penguins only had one shot and granted it came with like four minutes left from Evgeny Malkin on a, a slap shot when he just walked into the, you know, the blue line, like it wasn't a great shot, but these only had seven shots on their own. And we know that, you know, obviously Erickson gets the one, Lister will get the one at the end that we'll discuss, but Zetterberg had the one right before that. There's three shots right there. So in the opening 15 minutes of the third period, they had four shots. What the hell are they doing? They had a lot of zone, but they just didn't. <laughs> they had only six, and they had only six shots uh, total on the board, like six, seven, eight, nine minutes into the second period. So there were long stretches where they just weren't getting pucks on the net. You, you know, you're not going to score if you're doing that. And I give the Penguins credit. They blocked a lot, but the Red Wings also missed the net a lot, maybe passed up opportunities to shoot too. Two in the early stages of the third, Mark Andre Fleury didn't give up any rebounds. I give him a lot of credit. There were about three or four shots that came in the first what three or four minutes, covered up, quick whistles. There wasn't anything that was getting back around the circles, anything that could be retrieved by the Red Wings for a second chance opportunity. And 
uh, you know, maybe you don't want a ton of whistles when you're trying to protect the lead and you're in the last period to win the Stanley Cup. But I think in that situation, it might have been a good thing for the Penguins to, you know, calm the game down a little bit. And in Flurry's case, especially, because we know calm is not always a word that you would use to describe him. <laughs> <laughs> To have that happen in the early going, that's probably a good thing for him. Uh, and I shouldn't say the early going, the early going in the third period. Yeah, and that second power play of the game for Detroit, uh, when uh, Mark Eaton put the stick between the legs of one of the Red Wings and tripped him, uh, then Holmstrom's in front of the net, uh, as he usually is, and Flurry does a little poke down on his feet, falls backwards into Flurry. Flurry has to deal with that and then make a really good glove save on Nicholas Lidstrom. I mean, so, you know, it's one thing to have to worry about stopping the puck. And a lot of times you, you, you want to tell a goaltender, just worry about stopping the puck, you know, because you get distracted. That's what that guy's trying to do. He's trying to distract you from doing your job, and you may lose focus and the puck will go by you. But he was able to deal with Holmstrom in front with that little poke with the stick and also still recover to make that glove save. And uh, it reminded me that if Marc-Andre Fleury was Billy Smith, Holmstrom might have had a broken leg. This reminds me of a Tom Brass. You remember Tom Brass? Back into the ankles. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was demonstrative. That was what goalies did back then. That's just what you did, and the referees would let him get away with it. It was just kind of part of the game. Yeah, and I think, too, something. It was a sneaky thing that Flurry did. I don't know if you saw it, guys. You know, it was that little poke down by his, right at the bottom of his, uh, like his, his Achilles, so that his skate, you know, went out from under him and he fell backwards. And speaking of guys like Holmstrom and, and Lidstrom, I mean, I, we've talked obviously a lot in, you know, these podcasts about how the Red Wings had the older team and the older legs. And I think that was something, too, I thought it was interesting. I don't know if you guys caught this, but during the broadcast, uh, Pierre McGuire, who's between the benches, said that Mike Babcock was telling his players that their shifts were too long, and that's why they're getting tired. And I think you could see that almost like the fatigue, um, especially, too, with Nick Lidstrom. He played 10 minutes and 28 seconds in the second period alone. He literally played over half the period. And, you know, he's almost 40. Holmstrom's almost 40. And I mean, obviously, it's game seven of the Stanley Cup final. Guys are hungry. Guys want to win. But you could definitely sense that the Penguins had more of that hunger. And I don't just don't know if the Red Wings had enough in the tank to, to do it. And I think that was evident in this third period because, you know, even though they had their chances, they did get a goal to make it 2-1 from Jonathan Erickson with, uh, I want to say, six minutes left uh, they just they just didn't have enough to get over that hump and to get the score tied and, and kind of take it to overtime so i thought that was interesting that the fatigue really we talked about it catching up to them at different points in different games but i, mean, I think this is probably the best example of that this third period here you know michelle um in watching this i mentioned it earlier in the series hosa was very dangerous but he got less and less dangerous as the series went on and i don't know what red wings fans were thinking of him Looking at this guy, and I'm thinking, this guy is one of the most talented hockey players on the planet. And I'm not feeling anything coming from him right now. He's not, I don't see the emotion. I don't see the hunger, the desperation. He's kind of a mechanical hockey player. And, and, and I think that he let them down. I mean, he went to Detroit because he thought he'd have a better chance to win the cup as if to say, well, I don't have to do my part. You know, the, this way I get to just ride the wave. And, you know, I'm going to be with the best team. We're going to win the cup. I mean, it's like, I just felt like he, he didn't, he didn't make a, a, enough of a contribution considering, you know, his legacy as a, one of the better European born players really in the league that after came into the league in the last you know, 25 years. Yeah, you think if anyone would step up and show anger, it would be him, and he just didn't do it. And I think it was a very forgetful year for him in Detroit, that's for sure. Well, I think Mish said the, the Red Wings really looked tired, and I thought obviously they looked tired throughout most of the series as Staggy plays the world's smallest violin. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but I also think once they were down 2 nothing, they, they had to shorten their bench, and they had already taxed these guys. I mean, poor Zetterberg. I don't – I'd love to go back now and like look at his, the minutes this poor guy has played, and he was and he was all out effort every shift that he was on the ice. I mean that guy gave it his all and just had nothing left in the tank. And when they're shortening their bench and they're just asking too much of these guys who are already a little bit tired up in the age, and, and I think you're right, it just caught up to them. They ran out of gas, and that said, it still came down to six seconds. They still had a chance to get a tie. So you got to give the Red Wings a lot of credit, but I think they just kind of mismanaged their minutes throughout the entire series. And then once you get to the seventh game, you know, if, if you don't have it in the tank, if you don't have the juices to do it, just, you just can't do it. It's not about effort. It's about how much energy you can muster. And I think the Red Wings kind of ran out towards, there towards the end. I think they got out coached. I do. And, uh, you know, I, I think 
you look at it, we talked about it earlier. You, you don't think a guy like Justin Applicator might have made a given a, a jolt, uh, you know, so, given some something for Detroit if they had thrown him in there for game seven? That's, you know, they needed a spark. Uh, they didn't think they did. So I think one of the things, I mean, that's the, the, the flip side of the same coin. I talk about how, in the, my mindset, was I, we can't beat this team in Detroit. I think they thought they couldn't lose in Detroit. And I think that they maybe put a little bit too much stock in their, you know, their success that they, you know, that they were just going to win because they were, that's what they do on their home ice and we can't beat them. And maybe they didn't respect the Penguins uh, quite, quite enough. To, you know, to maybe try to change up the, you know, the the, uh, the, the the momentum or however you want to say it, just just give it a little different feel, like with a young player coming in there to give them a, a spark. They didn't play him. You said it earlier in, the, in these podcasts, Michelle. It's amazing. The guy was really good early, and he never he never got a sniff the rest of the series. Yeah, it is pretty crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy. Red Wings backed up in the depth, and we mentioned the excitement from the younger players within the Penguins lineup, but there still were some older guys in the Red Wings that had some impacts, an impact, I should say, on certain instances within the game, like, for example, Nick Cronwall. We talked about his hit earlier on Max Talbot. Well, uh, we said Detroit had, what, seven, eight shots on goal in the third period. A shot off the crossbar doesn't count as a shot on goal, but it does stop your heart. And that's probably what happened in Pittsburgh and Detroit for different reasons when that shot with, what, about two minutes and 15 seconds left in the game from Cronwall fluttered over Marc-Andre Fleury. I shouldn't say fluttered, wired over Marc-Andre Fleury and hit iron behind him. Uh, I actually talked to Billy Guerin for our radio aspect for this for when we do our intermission broadcast. And I asked him, what did you see and what, because he was on the bench at that moment. I said, what did you see and what were you thinking when that shot left Cronwall's stick? And he said, still with everything going on in the world today is there still fcc regulations here can i really say what i thought i was <laughs> well meanwhile yeah that that, the- that goal that would have tied the game you know they already had scored that first goal from erickson on that one timer with uh, 607 to go and the penguins had no shots on goal it was seven minutes to go in the period they had no shots i mean they were rope doping in the third period and you know see that's i think i, I think that's natural when you consider what the penguins had gone through in detroit here they were now finally in a position of controlling a hockey game and they weren't quite in the mode of generating more offense they were sitting back too much and i think if that game had lasted another five minutes the red wings would have tied that game because it it was just you can't keep playing like that forever and expect to to, to, you know to be successful Penguins hung on for dear life but the Cronwall shots hits the crossbar that ties the game. And uh, I think in, in, in retrospect, uh, the Penguins are fortunate that they didn't go in and they're fortunate that the Red Wings didn't tie the game because they weren't generating any offense whatsoever. You talk about the, the was 20 minutes, uh, Penguins probably a lot of fun lives. In the final one minute and 20 seconds, there were four whistles. In the final, in the final one minute, the final 80 seconds of this hockey game, you had four whistles, four excruciating whistles. And one thing we didn't touch on, which I think we can t- hit here quickly, is that the Penguins got dominated in the faceoff circle. I mean, they were really bad in that game, and it's all well and good throughout most of the game. But that, those final four plays, the Red Wings won every faceoff and were able to get opportunities off of every faceoff, including with 6.5 seconds left. Right, Josh? That's correct, and that was the one that, uh, well, we talk about moments within this game that have kind of been frozen in time. I know everyone talks about the save that Marc-Andre Fleury made on Nick Lidstrom. As Sam mentioned, a face-off win by Henrik Zetterberg. Brian Rafalski's shot kind of pinballed to that near circle. I want to hear from you guys, because you lived it as far as being a fan, as far as working that game, being at that game. What is going through your mind as that puck comes to the circle and we can all, I can, I mean, I know you guys can see it too. The slow motion of Flurry starting to shuffle with his body up and Lidstrom being, realizing that it's Lidstrom of all guys at that circle coming towards the puck. It's not Rod Stewart. It's Nick Lidstrom. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I remember, <laughs> well, it was cool too, because, you know, watching this game, uh, you could see that every single Red Wings fan at the Lewis Arena was on their feet. Um, I think starting around when Cronwell hit the post and I was also on my feet from where I was watching an apartment in Cedar Village and East Lansing on Michigan campus. And it just was, 
it's crazy how you can go on such a roller coaster of emotions in such a short period of time. Because yeah, you see Nick Lisham, I mean, you see he has all this net to shoot at. I mean, you couldn't have asked for that play, to, that sequence to go better up to that point. I mean, it's just so much desperation and there's so much player on that ice. For Zetterberg to win that back, for Walsh to get shot off, pop a break, so it's just really like, oh, perfect. Like this is like, <laughs> jump across the way he did. I'm not gonna lie, from that moment on to when I started working for the Penguins, I hated Marc Andre Fleury <laughs> for making that mistake. I mean, it was just it, it definitely I mean, I, I was just, I was here and then I was here. So that that was my perspective of it. But for Staggy and, and Sam actually being at the game, just what were you guys seeing? Well, it was at the very end and you're waiting to, for the time's ticking down. You're waiting for the clock to go. And, uh, you know, the Penguins are, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, they, they got to survive this somehow. This is, this is scary. I mean, and then what I think of in retrospect is that, hey, Josh said a little while ago that Fleur was doing a good job of controlling rebounds, but in this particular instance, he did not at all. He kicked it right out to Nick Lindstrom. It's like, oh, my goodness, what were you doing? So then he created the opportunity for Lindstrom to be able to basically tie the game when, you know, like with one second to go. Could you imagine if that puck goes in? Oh, my. So now Flower dives across. He comes out and kind of shuffles towards him and gets his body over, and Lindstrom lifts the puck. If Lindstrom shoots the puck along the ice, it goes in. He, he elevated it just enough that it went off of Flurry's logo, but otherwise it probably slides along the ice underneath it because he was Flurry was up in the air doing a Secret Service save. So, um, and then I looked over to my right as that happened, and I saw Ray Shiro and those guys, and it was like Ray, it was like Ray Shiro went, "Did we win the cup?" I think he said something like that. It was like this. It, it, they were like it, because it, you know it, there was no time to anticipate the win like not like you know time five four three two one yay we won it wasn't that it was like sudden life not sudden death sudden life you you know you won the cup and everybody was like shocked we won oh my god we won I can't believe we won and it was just awesome there, there was but there was no build up to that moment it was it was a reverse build up it was like you, you didn't want to look you wanted to cover your eyes because it was scary. The red, but that's how hard it is to knock out a champion. It's like and Gary Bettman, when he handed the cup to Sidney Crosby, he said, It takes a champion to beat a champion. And I thought that was a or to knock out a champion, I think were his words. That that's a really true in that case, because the Red Wings, they weren't going down without a fight and without you know, putting a scare into you. And that's what they did. Yeah, the funny thing too is uh, looking back on it now. The nice thing about it is that normally when you're covering these games in the final five minutes, you go down and you're out right outside the locker room because once the game's over, usually you have like a five-minute segue and then you go into the locker room. But because it was game seven, and they knew they were going to give the cup away. You had that leeway. So most of the media, we were able to stay up in the press box and, and watch it develop. And, uh, man, it, it's almost reminiscent I think, a little bit of Mario Lemieux's goal in game one against – the Blackhawks and way back in 92 with the shot, the pass, and Mario just in the right spot. Those players, Lidstrom, Muse, they know where to be. They know where to go. They're, they just always seem to end up in the right spot and get the right opportunity. And you're right, Staggy. Flurry definitely kicked that rebound out a little harder than he had to. <laughs> he was just trying to get it as far away from the goal as he wanted, but he was just trying to get it away, Not probably not realizing Lidstrom's right there. And then when Lidstrom got him, yeah, instead of – staying nice and straight up and even like kicking over he, he for whatever reason shuffles over instead of like giving a hard kick to line up in this position i think he might have been a little bit mentally panic mode there he comes over and then just like leans his body it was if you're looking at a technical standpoint it was an ugly ugly save for a goaltender but it looks great on the highlight reel right <laughs> and that's what really matters and then i remember the save was made the puck goes into the corner from there you're like play, clock, play, clock. I mean, your eyes are darting back and forth. Is this over? Is this over? Is this over? And, and I think even the players on the ice didn't know because the horn, I, I don't know if you remember that second, the horn never really sounded. So for the final, yeah. at the really end, like a lot of the guys didn't know is it over. And I remember Craig Adams like jumped on the puck and there was like one second left and was like refusing to move. And the Red Wings are jabbing at him to like try and get the puck. And the rest of the Penguins are just like standing around and they don't know when to celebrate. So you're right, it was kind of a weird moment because then some realized that it was zero. I think Talbot realized early threw his arms up and Flurry was like still 
against his post and Adams is on the ground. And I think how Gil came over to kind of like jumped on Adams's back. And you said so many players not knowing what the clock was, not knowing what was going on. So they kind of realized it at different times at, at different moments. And I think even the fans kind of realized at different times, at different moments, because it just happened so quick and you didn't know what the time was. It was just, it, you're right. It was like that almost sudden life, if you will, it, like just jolted you to life. And of course the whole Red Wings crowd, it jolted them to death. <laughs> well, the other uh, thing that occurs to me, guys, is that this was a cathartic uh, save for Flurry on so many levels because he had been a tragic figure throughout his career up to that point. He had a tendency to be involved in these moments of tragedy, you know, in games. Uh, thinking back to World Junior when he uh, allowed that awful goal against uh, uh, the U.S., um, you know, and I, 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 I feel like. That was a huge moment for Flower. He'd been pretty – people had been critical of him for whatever reason in Pittsburgh. is ridiculous because the guy was awesome. But uh, the fact of the matter is, you know, that was that was so close to being a total disaster. And uh, it, it, that's what made it so exhilarating, that it wasn't. And it was a, an amazing moment in, in Penguins history uh, that everybody remembers uh, vividly in their minds. I, when you think about it, and also uh, one that uh, – you know, people cherish forever. And um, it's just a great, great thing to watch it again. One of the best parts of the season is just seeing the celebration and the raw emotion all these guys' faces. That camera angle of the ice level shot of them all just embracing and one guy going to the next. It's like they don't even know, to Sam's point, the carryover from after the horn sounds and the initial celebration. Then you're just trying to find someone to hug and someone to jump on. And it's such a cool scene down there to see that. And I know, Sam, you, you eventually made your way down there. Uh, what was that like, first of all, you know, coming down to that ice level, being able to step into the scene there? I know we all experienced it in 16 and 17, but Oni was a little bit more unique because for a generation of Penguins fans, that was the first time they'd ever experienced something like this. I think it was cathartic in many ways. Uh, Staggy talked about the flurry save, but I think for the whole team after the 08 loss and how hard they took it for them to kind of come around and – the victory this time around was certainly a huge boost to them and it, it was just great seeing them all with their families you know that, that's something we always forget about we always see these players on the ice we forget their husbands their fathers you know their, their parents are there so it, it, it's a huge team celebration you realize it's bigger than just like the 20 guys on the ice it's it's a whole community of players a whole big penguins family that extends out. And for them to go through those battles those wars and then, then be able to come out and celebrate come out on the winning end and to share that moment with all the, the friends and family that they had there, I think it was really cool to see. I love the, how organized the Penguins were in terms of who gets the cup when. It's almost like they had a script. You know, uh, it, it was just like first it was Sid, then he gave it to Garen, who gave it to Gonchar, who gave it to Shatan, who gave it to Sakura, who gave it to Gill, who gave it to Boucher, who gave it to Fedotenko, who gave it to Adams, and then Eaton. You know, so they, all the veteran players, but it was like, let's get out the sheet let's see now uh, like uh, how do they know how did they know who was getting it next it was just amazing how orchestrated it was <laughs> great Some of the guys after all that mayhem after all that mayhem and now they've got they don't even know they're going to win necessarily and they know exactly who's getting the cup and when were you guys surprised that billy g was the first one i feel like he had to be it right and he seemed the obvious choice there the veteran that came over and I think he was the obvious guy to go first. Was he the oldest? He's the same. Were they going by seniority? I think they must have been. I, I think just the way Sid and the relationship they had and how much respect that Sid had for Billy G. And in a lot of the way, he kind of galvanized the group, too. I think they looked at him as one of the leaders, even though he was only there for such a short period at that point. He was only there for a month and a half before the playoffs began. So uh, I, I think they looked at him as, like, almost, almost the – the Ron Hainsey figure, if you will, the, the older guy that, you know, it's been so long, he hadn't won a cup in, since 95 with the Devils. So I think that they wanted to really, I think Sid had it in his mind way before then that that was going to be his go-to. About that June 12th date, guys, that's a, it was the anniversary of Badger Bob being hired. Uh, it was the 87th playoff game played that year. Um, Gino's parents were not there. As big a story as they were in that series, with them showing them all the time, they didn't go to Detroit because they felt they jinxed Gino in the earlier games. So they stayed home and watched it on TV. Do you believe that? Vladimir and Natalia. 
And, uh, <laughs> and when Jordan Stahl lifted that cup, he looked like King Kong. He, <laughs> he was, he looked so big and he was such a, he was the man in game seven, you know, like his defensive play it reminded me a little bit of when Mario, the way, when he would take over games defensively uh, early in his career in the playoffs in the nineties, he would take over games defensively. Of course, he was also awesome uh, offensively. And George Stahl was good offensively too, but from a defensive standpoint, he looked as big as life, bigger than life out there to me. So Malkin got the con smite. Russia never win that. You mentioned the, the scene when Gary Bettman handed the cup to Sid, youngest captain ever, uh, to, to lift the Stanley Cup over his head. I also thought this was interesting. Penguins became the first team since the 1971 Montreal Canadiens to win a game seven on the road. Now, obviously, it's Stanley Cup final. Uh, now, obviously, that doesn't happen every year. It's not like that's a yearly occurrence. But still, it had been a long time since a road team went into that situation about that 71 Canadians team, by the way. They were no slouch as far as their roster was concerned. Uh, but to go into a building like Joe Louis Arena, where, as you mentioned, Stag, the Red Wings just felt like they could not be beaten. And quite honestly, everything pointed to the fact that they would not be beaten in there. And to do that, pull that off, and win the first cup of his career, uh, I think it's a pretty amazing moment in Penguins history when you look back on it. It's got to be up there with as important as any. As far as on it. Absolutely. And, and, you know, the last team to win a, a game seven in, in, in uh, Pittsburgh was the Pittsburgh Pirates in 79. They won on the road, a game seven on the road in Baltimore. So that was the first time in the city of Pittsburgh we had seen that uh, in, in a long time. So, uh, yeah, that, 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 that speaks to, I think, how hard it is to do and what an amazing accomplishment it really was uh, for the Penguins to beat that team in that building in that game, a game seven, that was a re really special. Um, and then it was time to uh, celebrate, and they stayed a long time at the arena, and they finally got on all the airplanes and left. And I went back on that same plane that I flew in on, and I got in my car, and uh, I drove to Mario's house. And uh, that's where everybody gathered. And I still could see in my mind's eye, I could still see Sid walking in with the cup. And it probably was 5 o'clock in the morning by the time we got there. Because it was, it took forever for everybody to get there. Was, there was food everywhere, of course. Mario had it totally catered. Everybody was there, all the owners, you know, the staff, the players. And Hal Gill was half in the bag, and he was <coughs> in his underwear. He was literally in his skivvies, standing in Mario's fountain. Mario had this like fountain out, uh, off his patio. And Hal Gill is standing in the fountain like a four-year-old kid in one of those baths you put in the backyard in his underwear. <laughs> And uh, it was freezing. I don't know if you guys remember, but that night in Pittsburgh, June 12th of 2009, I bet, I bet if you look back in, in, the, in the weather archives, you'd find that it was about 40 degrees uh, when we got to Mario's house. So here's Hal Gill in his underwear in like 43 degree weather, standing in a fountain. And uh, then ultimately, uh, you know, you know the rest of the story. Mario ended up in the pool with the cup and there were some famous pictures being circulated around of that. And, uh, just a fantastic, fun, awesome celebration that ultimately led to that parade, which was just mind-boggling to be in the middle of that parade and see the way those fans reacted and hanging from those parking garages and all those little kids and rows and rows of people cheering and celebrating as the players went down those streets of the downtown Pittsburgh. That was really, really a, a magical time in, in Pittsburgh Penguins history, Pittsburgh history. <laughs> well, I figured you had to have a few busts of champagne, so we did that. It was myself, Botash, and Bob Airy in the back of a truck. So we had a good time, no doubt about that. And then I was I was scared to death because I had to get up and speak in front of you know a couple hundred thousand people down there on Boulevard of the Allies. I wasn't really relishing that, to, to be honest with you guys, but uh, we got through it, and it was a lot of fun, really a lot of fun. I think it's fair to say all four of us probably relish this opportunity to look back at 2009, the Stanley Cup championship for the Penguins. And I hope, and I'm sure I speak for all you guys as well, that anyone listening, anyone watching, it's such a weird time right now. If this maybe gave you an hour, an hour and a half of thinking about something that does not involve your personal health and going outside or whatever the rules may be, uh, then I think we did our job. So this is a lot of fun, guys. Looking forward to doing some more down the line. Hey, really fun, Josh. You do a great job, and um, it's just fun to share all those uh, memories with you guys. Yeah, 
Yeah, I agree. Especially. Sorry. Yeah, I just quickly, I mean, just growing up a Red Wings fan, I was so lucky to be able to watch for, you know, Stanley Cups in Detroit, but um, and so it's been fun reliving it from that perspective. But, you know, I couldn't be happier now to, to be here uh, as a member of the Penguins family to have an owner like Mary Lemieux to have a captain like Sidney Crosby. I mean, they're the truly the best of the best. And it's seriously an honor and a privilege to be able to, you know, work for Mary and work alongside Sid and um, you know, to be able to deal with players like Mark Andre Fleury, who turned out, like I said before, to be one of my favorite people of all time. So <laughs> I know all of us feel incredibly lucky to be doing what we do. And I feel this, especially for me, was just a huge reminder of that, you know, just, you know, how privileged we are. So definitely was a lot of fun. Uh, hot stove in with you guys for this, for sure. Surprised Michelle didn't wear a black and gold uh, shirt today. She's already, you know, turned coat, already turned the page on the whole team. Just, wow. I had one last item of red clothing, so I figured I'd better get it out. Yeah, this has been great. Obviously, that was a great run for, for everyone. I think Penguins fans will never forget that. You know, the, the losing 08 and the heartbreak on home ice, watching the Red Wings lift the cup there, not knowing if you'd ever get back. And to get back the next year with the rematch, facing Hulse, and then to win it in Detroit and raising the cup there, you know, it was just a, a poetic justice, a poetic way to end that season. And that all those players deserved it, too. I mean... Talk about from top to bottom, the roster, we, we talked about it many times, but top to bottom, all those guys deserved every bit of that celebration, every bit, you know, how Gil deserved to be in his underwear in the fountain staggy. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad they enjoyed it. And you're right, Staggy, they had a great time. They were just a young group having a lot of fun, and, and it was just good times. And it's amazing it's been so long, but, man, it is great to look back. Just before you go, Josh, I want you to have this image because you've, you've seen this down on the south side. At Mario's South Side Saloon. They have a couple of floors up above, and the boys all gathered there um, and after the parade and everything, and they hung out up there. And Jordan Stahl was hanging out of the window of Mario's Southside Saloon with the cup, holding it out, and all these people were down on the street looking up at the Penguins having a party up there on the top floors of the Mario's Southside Saloon. I'll never forget that scene of Jordan Stahl, that big you know, moose hanging out the window with the cup, and everybody going, hey! Oh man, what a feeling. It's a great feeling. That's what makes the cup so great is the fact that everybody gets to share in it. It's such a great championship to win. We're so lucky. So lucky to be a part of it so many times. Third of five Stanley Cups for the Penguins. What a visual that is to end you with here on this Scoop Rewind uh, presented by PPG. We hope to be able to do more of these for you down the line. We have some ideas in store. So uh, again, we hope to be able to join you as this process continues and Hopefully hockey talk continues as well soon. And then hopefully real hockey resumes uh, in front of our very eyes. For Michelle Krekiola, Sam Kassan, and Paul Staggerwald, I'm Josh Getzoff. Also want to thank our executive producer, Wayne Gretzky-Anderson, and everyone out there for tuning in. Stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll catch you next time on the Scoop Rewind presented by PPG.